Hi, this is Sean. Thank you for joining me again. In this video, I'm going to be discussing improvisation. It's not a series of how-to exercises, although there is some of that at the end. This is much more getting into what I consider the truth of the matter, some tough love, and what's holding people back. So I've taught students for several decades, and I find it a little bit heartbreaking to see people who've been down the road of the books and the courses and still haven't got the freedom to improvise. So what I've done is spend that time learning from them and breaking it down more and more and more, refining it more and more and more to a set of skills that have to be in place that for, for most people, to be honest, for anybody who says, I can't improvise, you either have these skills in place or you don't. And if you do, you can start to get some freedom. So that's what this video is going to be about. I will be doing a lot of talking. So if you're hoping for just a series of how-to exercises, this probably isn't the one for you, but this can really change your improvising life. So I hope you'll stay with me. Let's get into it. So I'm mainly speaking to level twos in this video. For me, I'd say a level one is somebody just learning the chords, just getting into jazz, trying to figure out the progressions and learn a couple of tunes. A level two has a few tunes down but no real freedom. The tunes are exactly the same every single time they play. Forget bits and pieces, probably can't remember more than the last one or two tunes they played. If they have to go back five or ten tunes that they played, they've got to relearn them because it's really read or remember skills, not language skills that are being spoken and created every time they play, if you see what I mean. And certainly isn't improvising and not sure where to turn, totally confused about how to start improvising. It may be some level threes as well. For me, a level three has more down and more freedom, but may well wanting be wanting to improve the way they're improvising and strengthen the skills underneath. You know, 45,000 one-to-ones taught during my teaching life and the problems are always the same. Then, then they don't differ very much. And to be honest, I've found that the typical videos that we see and the typical books, they're not very helpful because I always say that good playing doesn't automatically equal good teaching. And I also often say that jazz can't be taught, but it can be learned. So what you can teach somebody is how to learn it, because ultimately we have to become our own teachers. I think that's very important as well. There seems to be, for most people who are stuck in that place where they just can't seem to fight out, fight their way out of this prison of same thing, same way every time. There seems to be no real focus on ingredients and skills. There seems to be a lot of focus on tune, tune, tune. I like this tune, which is why I'm going to try and learn to play it. Never really got freedom from it or with it. Got bored, another tune. Went to a jam session or to a jazz course or to a jazz teacher or to a jazz book or to a jazz video. I think I'd like to do what they're doing. So let me learn that tune. I like Round Midnight. <laughs> For me, one of the hardest tunes, I think, <laughs> to get right. Yet I meet level twos all the time who are trying to play it, you know, that kind of thing. So when we can focus on the skills and use the tunes to learn those skills, then we're speaking the language in real time. So this is another thing. I'll get people who come and say, oh, no, no, I know the, the two fives that lead to particular places in keys. I know the things that you teach already. My problem is that I can't play. It's a different problem. It's not a different problem. And pretty soon they start going through my developing fluency course and realize that there is another way you can learn to process these skills in real time whilst you're playing. That's the most important thing. Not having a conversation about the ingredients of a tune technically before you play it or after you play it in order to pass an exam, but for those things to be occurring to you as you play. So you have rules for things. You have been to certain places before. You recognize the terrain because you've been there before, even if you've been there in a different key. And that, for me, is a good reason for playing things in another key. So let's take an example. Let's say that I was playing... Let's take a tune everybody's heard of. Let's say I was playing Misty, okay? Which I think is far too hard for level twos, but many of them try to learn to play it and then try and learn to do something with it. And that itself, because it's too difficult, causes all those issues, right? The best they can do is get through it without making a mistake. And then they think linear so they try to add to something that's not cooked and and 
and ice a cake that's not cooked and it doesn't work, right? But if we take, take that as an example... So we're in E flat. Now we, let's just take that amount. This happened to me just last week actually. So a guy comes, he's trying to play Misty because he's been told he needs to be able to play it for a certain situation, right? Fine, fair enough. I say, the first thing I say to him is play the E flat major scale. And he goes, yeah, yeah, fine. Oh, no, 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 you don't understand. I do know it. Hold on. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Hold on, hold on. No, no, I do know it. No, I, I'm sure it's... There you go. Yeah, I knew I know. I don't, I don't know what's wrong with me today. Right. <laughs> well, the thing is, if you're going to improvise over that and know the chord changes properly and not know that so that it can't be taken away from you, then no chance, right? Second of all, okay, do we know the chords in the key of E flat? Do we know that this is chord number one and this is chord number two going through the scale? Chord number three in the scale, four, five, six, and seven. For anyone who doesn't know what I'm doing, if I took the key of C and put a chord on the first degree, I'm just doing this, but it, I was doing it in the key of E flat, right? And if that's not solid, which it, it isn't if you don't know the scale, then the next part won't be solid, which is the progressions in the key. So the first thing that Misty does is... begins on chord one, then... plays a two five... To four. Look at some of my videos about how to do things like this if you're not sure. Tricky key. I know I'm speaking above a level two, but I'm just trying to give you an idea of how the language is being processed as we go. In the key of C, C major. Now, four in C is one, two, three, four, F major seven. So, two five is G minor seven, C seven to F major. 2-5 that leads to F because if we took the key of F the second chord in the scale of F would be G minor 7 3 4 5 would be C7 okay so we use that even if we're in the key of C to lead to chord number 4 F major 7 if that person's still solidifying things like that in different keys is E flat really where they should be if they're not even solid with the E flat major scale and, and the simple chords in, it, in E flat, let alone the progressions that lead to chords in E flat. And it stuns me that I cannot buy a book that goes through this stuff properly and goes through all the stuff we need in, in jazz standards properly. It is interesting to me that jazz standards contain this language very clearly. And then the other issue becomes that we try and learn jazz from, say, buying a real book. Somebody says, oh, all the jazz tunes are in the real book. But on page one, you could be dealing with, let's say, after you've gone, right? On page two, you could be dealing with a tune from, I mean, let's, let's say that's, you know, 20s or so. I'm not certain. But then on the next page, you could be dealing with a funk tune from the 80s. <laughs> Right, and trying to make sense of all these different styles which use harmony differently not entirely differently but differently okay so it's having some consistency so i highly recommend that people have a study of the jazz standards and the common progressions that come up in all of them so for example we just learned a tune that goes one two five to four well, tons of tunes do that. Let's say if I'm playing in the key of F and I'm playing, I know, Nearness of You. One. Two, five to four in the key of F. So Misty in the key of F. Slight difference, but here's the two, five to four. And that's why... If you can learn to play tunes in various keys, which Barry Harris made me do in singers' workshops, <laughs> it was one of the most terrifying times of my life. <laughs> and I didn't expect to learn that much in those singers' workshops. But actually, that's where I learned the most about fluency. You know, not, not just about 
the method, but about the fluency, then you start to know the tune better in the key that you're supposed to be playing it in in the first place. That's the point for me of transposing. That's one reason. And also, as we just saw, two different tunes in different keys, same ingredients. And if you're playing from the perspective of ingredients, then you start to see the commonality between tunes. And then your life stops becoming about memorizing. I even have Jazz Skills members that go through my Developing Fluency course, get halfway through and say, are you saying I should not be memorizing? Then how am I supposed to remember it? And the answer is always the same. It's, or the answer has evolved into this, let's say. It's not memorizing as much as it is recognizing. In other words, let's say that I am in the key of C. We'll use the same chord example we've been using. And the next thing I see is G minor seventh. I should know that I'm beginning the two five, G minor seven, C seven to F, the two five, to the fourth degree of C. I should recognize that just from the G minor seventh. And let's not over it, let's not underestimate. The sound becomes familiar to us if we're giving those things names or categories, then we can start to recognize the sounds of them rather than looking at a lead sheet and seeing just a mess of chords we've got to get from the beginning to the end because none of these things relate to each other. So you play tune after tune after tune. You've got thousands of data points, but they're not connected to anything, right? So it's about connecting those things so that your playing life is a journey and one thing connects to the next. It's not, oh, you played one tune and then you played another tune. Well, that's just a load of stuff to remember. It took you three months to get good at that tune. Well, now you're going to pick up another one. By the end of the year, you got four tunes and you can't remember the first two. You can remember some of the third one. No good, right? So, and then therefore you can't break into that level where you can start to free up and do something with these ingredients because the ingredients themselves are not solid. So there's no focus therefore on language, the language of tunes and chord progressions that build up tunes. There are only a few principles, only a few, five-ish to no standards, right? And those same things come up in every jazz standard. So isn't it worth knowing them? Yeah. Otherwise, it just becomes a feat of memory, like going to classical lessons. And I've got nothing against classical lessons or classical music. But people like Bach and Chopin were improvisers and used to play with other musicians, creating music spontaneously. The bass players used to have something called figured bass, just like our bass players that look at chord symbols and create a bass part, right? They did that in their own way. But what that music has lost in the learning of it and the teaching of it now is that ability to understand and interpret ingredients and use them as a musician. As a jazz musician, you're learning an art form which is composed spontaneously. So for me, improvisation. And for when I say improvisation, just to be clear, I'm not talking about the difference between looking at the music and saying... And then getting to, let's say... I'm not talking about that when I say improvisation. I'm talking about building, although that, you know, that what we are talking about relates to that as well. There will be some overlap in the video I recorded for YouTube called something like why you still can't play without reading the music, right? I'll link that and you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about playing lines in this one. Something. I'm talking about having the freedom to create lines as you play. So, I think another part of the problem is that separation leads to this idea of theory over here. People say, will you teach me jazz theory on jazz skills? Not kind of, yeah, but I'll teach you to learn music as you play 
rather than learn theory at a desk and playing at a piano, okay? So the more you study, for me, the correct way in, in terms of learning how to play and interpret your ingredients as you go, the closer that gap becomes and you fill it until there isn't really a difference between theory and playing, which leads to one of the most common questions I'm asked once I start teaching people about improv, which is, you can't be thinking about all those principles whilst you play, right? You're thinking that this is a one, this is a two, five to four, this is a four, and that's a four minus six. Don't worry about all the names for now. Well, yeah, I am, and I can, as you just saw. And yes, the scales make sense to me in real time as well. The reason you're possibly finding that such a surprise and not possible for you is just because you've never done that before and learned music from that perspective. I'm no more intelligent than you. I'm, it's just a matter of working in a particular way. And and to be honest, as I said, 45,000 one-to-ones later and hundreds of videos on jazz skills. In fact, I'm glad I went through those 45,000 lessons and used that to build jazz skills because I don't think it would have worked otherwise. I would have been somebody that just put stuff up because I think it's what people should learn rather than based on the problems people are having, right? Because the problems are always the same. But the point being, yes, I can think of those and so will you whilst you're playing, but it's not, you're not having to work it out. It's more like autopilot thinking, yeah? It's more like somebody who's speaking, let's use English as an example, speaking the English language. I have no idea what I've said over the last few minutes or what I'm going to say in the next few minutes. But knowing the English language means that one thing leads to another and that's how music is as well. I think another part of this equation is that jazz musicians often don't know how we got here and therefore what's missing for somebody else. And that's what I mean by great playing isn't necessarily great teaching. And yes, if you spend six, eight hours a day, as I did in the earlier days, then it tends to come together. But you don't necessarily know exactly why and exactly how and exactly when things came together. You just played a lot and things came together. And therefore, things that have clicked for you, you start to think, oh, that's what I should show somebody else. But does that somebody else know their scales? Do they know their chords? You know, all the things we've been talking about form your foundation because that's what you're improvising over. There are still people who think that improvising means just playing the melody differently. That, that's that's just playing the melody differently. We want to get completely away from the melody. This is misty for me. This is messing with the melody of misty, right? Something like that. So it's, you know, it's just thinking about that differently. I actually think messing with melodies can be a good way into improvisation as well because something is fixed and something is improvised and therefore it's easier to get into it. So let's say that was the tune. You know, you just mess with half steps. See that half step below the landing note? You know, stuff like that. Anyway, that's perhaps for another day. So I don't want to leave you without some action steps, right? So first of all, know chords 1 to 7 really well in several keys. Know the important progressions. Anything that, that I have that's related, I will link to. These are the kinds of things we take you through in the Developing Fluency course on Jazz Skills. Learning chords from scratch. Learning the important progressions as you play with tracks. Putting them into tunes. Using tunes to practice the language rather than just playing a tune, getting the melodies down, then voicings, you know, so we do that. But these are things you can be doing as well. In terms of learning to actually improvise and begin building phrases, I believe that our job is to be doing two things. First one is having a strategy to build short phrases. And second one is making the joins between chord changes without breathing, without slowing down. 
So just a quick look into the kind of thing I mean. So let's take a simple little scale. Let's take the C major scale and I'll go down a half step and up two notes, right? From D, down a half step, up a couple of notes, right? All the way through. I'm going to speed up. I'm not saying you should do that, <laughs> just to fit it in. You haven't finished because you hit C. You finished when you get to the end like that, right? Now, most people are going to give up and go, oh, yeah, too basic. I want to know what you're doing. What about improv? This, These are the building blocks, simple little things, scale phrases, interval phrases. So th that was a scale phrase. These, This would be an interval phrase. Let's say thirds, broken thirds through the scale. I have no idea what we're going to do with this yet. <laughs> Let's say... Okay, we're going to put a broken third at the end of our original scale phrase. Can you take that through the scale, right? Okay, so what happens when you skip the first note? Let's do it slowly. One and two and three and four. One and two and three and four. Going down as well now. <laughs> Did you notice I even skipped a note at the end? So I ended up doing this. Let's go from the beginning. And down some notes and join them right that's one way because this happened as I was playing so I'm going to explain it so down up interval broken third down the scale and do the next one great exercise do these slowly enough for you to figure them out comfortably without mis making mistakes and then I cut off the first and the last note guess what we're starting to get something that swings so that's my point we could go on and on but the simple ingredients lead to something that's beautiful eventually so I highly recommend doing that kind of thing whilst you're learning tunes but separating it don't make improv right I got a tune how do I improvise over it be learning skills separately and then you'll be able to apply it what whilst you're playing tunes because there are a few things to learn you know doodling over a tune is very important so if it was misty in c simple stuff i know some of you'll be saying that's not simple but what i'm saying is get anything you can get to begin with be able to get from the beginning to the end good bad or indifferent and then zoom into areas where you think you can polish them up and make a difference, okay? Let's leave it there for today because that's quite a lot. I hope it's helpful for you. If you're interested, I take you through everything you need on Jazz Skills in the Developing Fluency course, which people really seem to love because they finally get those skills together and start to get the freedom they really deserve. So perhaps you'll join me there. Thanks a lot for watching this, and I really wish you all the best with your improvising. Bye for now.